Hello and welcome to PFF Fantasy Football Podcast, USFL edition. I'm your host, Ian Harditz, and thanks for tuning in to another lovely episode where we talk all things actual football being played right now. You will not hear us complain about a random training camp storyline here, or Najee Harris gaining four pounds more this time than he did last year, for example. No, we are talking live professional football and everything that just happened in the week eight of the USFL. Uh, any YouTubers out there might notice I'm kind of uh, drenched right now. It was happened to be a rainstorm when I got out of the grocery store, and I don't believe in umbrellas. So you know what? I took my yearly L today. Happens about once a year, but the rest of the time, I won't have to carry those useless things around. I'll have full access of both my hands. Will not. Will continue to not worry about getting a little bit wet from time to time. So with all that out of the way, let's break down. You know, a good, not great week eight uh, bit of action. We had two pretty damn good games, in my opinion. Two games that, while close, didn't exactly give us the sort of points that we're hoping for in the year 2022. So with all that said, let's get going with the New Jersey Generals taking down the Pittsburgh Maulers 29-18 to in 20 years. Probably not, but you can imagine. They'll be talking about this as the Darius Victor game. Not one, not two, but three rushing touchdowns, all of which came inside the 10-yard line. I mean, it's been a consistent like rotation between him and Trey Williams throughout the entire season, but once they get inside the 10, it's just been the Darius Victor show. He now leads the USFL in both rushing touchdowns and rushing yards for the 20th time on this lovely podcast. He is truly the USFL's, USFL's version of Doug Martin, a.k.a. the Muscle Hamster, but not to be outdone by PFF's highest graded offensive player of the year, Cavante Turpin, also kicked in a touchdown himself, about 20, 24 yards out. All he did was take a crosser, but my God, man, ankle or angle erasing speed from Cavante Turpin, and we've seen that all season. With the ball in his hands, I don't think anybody is better in the USFL. Not so sure he's going to have the size to eventually make a push for the NFL, but you know what? It's 2022. We got wide receivers coming in under 170 more than ever. Maybe, just maybe, it can happen. Happen. So three touchdowns for Victor, one for Turpin. In terms of the Pittsburgh Maulers, just couldn't get a ton going. Roland Rivers was able to drive straight down the field and get a touchdown. Obviously, Roland came in uh, last week for Vad Lee in the fourth quarter after Vad Lee apparently wasn't showing good enough body language for Kirby Wilson. Roland now takes every single snap this week. This is the fourth quarterback we've seen play basically an entire game for the Pittsburgh Maulers. Clearly, it's working out with their 1-7 and seven record through eight weeks. But good job on Roland. Finding the end zone five-yard draw on the first drive of the game and then later in the fourth quarter hit Isaiah Henney for a 25-yard touchdown. Henney has been playing very well. Unfortunately, Because Trey Walker got suspended last week, it seemed like that impacted him now working as a number four receiver on this team. I still have no idea why Bailey Gaither is out of the rotation, but at a minimum, Isaiah Henney playing ahead of Trey Walker, while I don't think it should be an either, you know, we should get both guys on the field. I'm not sure that Henny needs to replace um, what Walker was bringing to the table, but Henny has been very good with the ball in his hands, and particularly on this 25-yard touchdown. Really just took a ho-hum curl, but wasted no time getting the ball, getting upfield, ultimately found his way into the end zone. Cool moment after this was the fact the USFO gives you the option to either do an onside kick or you get to attempt a 4th and 12 from, I believe, your own 35-yard line. Roland Rivers ended up converting that 4th and 12 and kept the next drive alive. Unfortunately, it wasn't to be. The Generals won by 11 and covered. Remember, good teams win, great teams cover. Offensive players in the game got to be the Generals triplets. Darius Victor at running back, Cavante Turpin at wide receiver, and Luis Perez at quarterback who was out there taking every single snap with DeAndre Johnson, once again missing time due to that ankle injury. So Victor overall, 17 carries, 87 yards, and a trio of touchdowns. Got over the 100-yard mark total with 19 scoreless yards through the air. Turpin, 83 yards and a touchdown receiving another 10 rushing yards. As we say every week, Cavante Turpin is the USFL's best version of Debo Samuel that we can come up with with 59 of his yards came after the catch. Truly is electric in space. And finally, Luis Perez, 18 of 24 passing, 220 yards, 9.2 yards per attempt for those of you counting at home, and not a single interception. Second highest grade of the week from any USFL quarterback. Defensive player of the game, amazing name here. Generals defensive tackle, Hercules Mataafa. Has a hyphen, uh, not a hyphen, an apostrophe in the last name. My apologies, but first name Hercules, and the guy plays defensive tackle. Like, you can't make this shit up. So, six pressures, an elite 35% win rate. Wasn't able to get a sack, but as we've seen over the years, pressures tend to be far more indicative and consistent of high-end defensive line play. Great game from Hercules. 
looking at some of the fantasy football usage notes. First off with the victorious generals. Again, Luis Perez taking each and every snap with DeAndre Johnson out of the picture. Trey Williams and Darius Victor. Again, we're splitting usage, but scary moment at the end of the game. I didn't get eyes on every single snap of this one Friday night. You know, I, I love my fiance. It's going to be hard to continue that relationship if I'm missing every single, uh, you know, potential uh, moment for USFL in addition to that we're already doing that in the NFL. But anyway, Trey Williams late in the fourth quarter, apparently from what I'm seeing on Twitter, did suffer a head slash neck injury. I did not see an update on the general's Twitter. I hope he's okay. From a usage standpoint, if Trey Williams is going to be missing time, while I would imagine they would not let Victor be the only running back on the roster, I do think that him and also Cavante Turpin would see their just rushing workload really go to the moon. I mean, Victor in particular, we would be looking at as a 70% plus snap. Three down running back, that would be really tough to keep out of both cash and tournament lineups alike. But again, could also see Turpin having a leap forward as well if Williams is forced to miss time. At wide receiver, Darius Shepard was sidelined again with that hamstring injury. Alonzo Moore, Jamal Moore, and Kevontae Turpin continue to work in three wide receiver sets. Turpin's only out there for 52% of the snaps, 71% routes, whereas both of the Moores are at 96% routes. But honestly, they force feed Turpin the ball enough, both on the ground game and through the air, that I don't think it's too much of an issue. Looking at the Maulers, again, Roland Rivers took every single snap. Will he next week? Who knows? Like, honestly, maybe he's just replaced by someone that's not even on the team yet. Maybe Roland Rivers is replaced by someone that hasn't even made up their mind if they want to play quarterback for their life yet. And But Kirby Wilson will put him on the bench anyway. So you just don't know. There are absolutely no givens in this offense other than the fact that it's going to be an annoying three-back committee because Garrett Groshek and Madre London aren't enough, right? We got to get Mikey Daniel, the fullback, in there. Get him three carries, 22% snaps. I mean, my God, we really do have a two running back committee here, but neither of them could even hit 50% snaps or 40% routes because we got to get the fullback involved. He did pick up a third and short. He also hurt a little guy last week. I mean, this is not a slight on Mikey Daniel, the person or the football player, but man, those fullbacks can make things annoying in fantasy football land. And a wide receiver, Delvin Hardaway and Jalen McCleskey leading the way, both in terms of routes and air yards. 114 for Hardaway, 115 for McCleskey. Of course, when you have Trey Walker and Bailey Gay, they're giving your offense really the most juice that we've seen all season. You got to only throw them four targets over the course of the entire game. Bailey Gaither, 2% of the routes. I don't think he was hurt. I don't get it. I th really thought Bailey Gaither, to a slightly lesser extent, Trey Walker, Two of the better wide receivers we've seen in the USFL, apparently not in Kirby Wilson's mind. Maybe they were eating pizza or something instead of chicken salad. Anyway, Generals firmly in the playoffs. They've clinched 7-1 and one, despite having to work without DeAndre Johnson over the last few weeks. Again, Darius Victor, Kevontae Turpin. This offense is a nightmare when they were able to get up, run the ball, let their playmakers do their thing. Going into this week, Victor and Turpin were PFS top two highest graded offensive players. That has not changed after eight weeks team is capable of beating anyone on any given Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. Birmingham Stallions took down the New Orleans Breakers. This one will be a slightly, uh, you know, not quite as long of a recap. 10-9 in favor of the undefeated Birmingham Stallions. Lone touchdown for the Stallions came on their second drive of the game. Jamar Smith threw a B-E-A-utiful 27-yard touchdown to Adrian Hardy. Truly just dropped it in the bucket in the back of the end zone. Good job by Hardy getting his feet down as well. New Orleans, right at halftime, came out, sense of urgency, went right down the field. Taiwan Taylor had a nice 44-yard catch to get them by the goal line. Then Anthony Jones punched it in from three yards out. But that was it. Kyle Sloter, three interceptions, was not his day. And you got to wonder with uh, Zach Smith, I believe, and Shea Patterson waiting in the wings, how much longer of a leash he'll have. We get the passing yards, but just too many boneheaded decisions. So I'm not going to slander Kyle Sloter for his quote about trying to be the 32nd best quarterback um, in the world. Aren't you supposed to have that type of confidence? Like, I always get mad when uh, people chastise these athletes for trying to, when they come out and they're usually asked a question about, like, do you consider yourself the best? Or they'll ask a fighter if he thinks he can beat the champ. And he's like, absolutely. Like, yeah, what do you expect him to say? And you know what? If we want to mock the NFL guys making $15 million a year for saying stuff like that, go ahead. But in a semi-pro league with these guys that are just trying to keep their football dreams alive, Kyle Sloter says something that's maybe a little bit out there. Maybe you don't need to chastise him. Maybe you can go outside, touch some grass. I don't know. Just my two cents on the matter. Offensive player of the game, though, got to be Stallions wide receiver Marlon Williams. Seven catches, 109 yards, no touchdowns. But, man, he looked 
good with the ball in his hands. I mean, true juice, you know, not quite Kevonte Turpin level, but pretty close. And for him to kind of display the route running and just a hands ability to get 109 yards, great stuff. Single highest offensive grade of the week at 89.9. Defensive players of the game, we got four of them. This was a 10 to 9 game, but unlike kind of the Gamblers uh, Bandits game that happened late Sunday, I think this was a little more so due to great defense as opposed to just terrible offense. So Stallions Ed's Dondrea Tillman, he's been on here a couple times. Stallions cornerback Josh Shaw, I think he's had a couple as well. Stallions safety Tyree Robinson and Breakers cornerback Keith Washington. What do they all have in common? Four of just six players supposed to PFF defensive grade north of 90 on the week. So again, shout out to Tillman, Shaw, Robinson, and Washington on their great game. In terms of the fantasy workload notes, Jamar Smith, 95% of the snaps. Briefly left the field for Alex Magoo, and I didn't think it was all on Smith. Like, last week was pretty damn bad. He had one big drop last week. This week, it felt like it was three or four of them, and a couple just big plays I think could have given them a chance to get more points. Wide receivers didn't do him many favors. But anyway, Magoo comes in, keeps the read option because, of course, he does. This dude literally, I don't think, has ever given the ball on a read option. To his credit, he's pretty fast with the ball in his hands. But Magoo, unfortunately, injured his ankle. Tried to come back in later and had to immediately hobble back off the sideline. So we were already pretty certain that Smith was going to be the quarterback for the overwhelming majority of snaps. 90% dropbacks, I'd say, is uh, pretty safe during any given week. But if McGuire's going to be hurt, completely removes that risk. And we don't have to worry about him going at wide receiver um, either. Nothing against Alex Magoo, but man, like who ever thought that was a good idea? At running back, Bo Scarborough, not quite featured as much. He was someone that we were willing to kind of eat the chalk with in DFS. Didn't quite work out because, you know, Matt Colburn had to go nuclear again. But anyway, with Scarborough, C.J. Maribel, and we talked about this being a possibility and a trend throughout the league when these guys get a little bit healthier. They play more, like coming back from the injury. Makes sense. Not exactly rocket science. But in this one, Bo Scarborough, 62% snaps, 14 carries and three targets. But CJ Maribel is out there for 45% snaps, five carries and one target. So Scarborough, I still think he's a great bet to reach, you know, 15 combined carries and targets during any given week. But based on what we saw in week six and seven compared to week eight, it was looking like that line was going to be 20-25. Don't think Scarborough is someone we you know, need to force in lineups as long as CJ Maribel is going to be healthy. Good back in his own right and mentioned already but marlon williams 11 targets 119 air yards nobody else on the team had more than three targets this was due to some injuries though so marlon williams had a 92 percent route rate osiris mitchell and michael darius were the next two most used guys mitchell almost had a touchdown early on it was like a six yard catch and he started reaching for the end zone got the ball knocked out never supposed to reach for the end zone kids just tuck that thing give yourself a chance on the next play either way just realized Victor Bolden was out this week with a hamstring and Jeffrey Thomas was on the inactive roster. So if we see either of them come back, uh, it's going to at a minimum eat in the Marlon Williams target share, albeit it'd be tough to get him out of three wide receiver sets at this point. And finally, Sage Surratt, 92% route rate at tight end. Don't usually see players in that position putting up those sorts of numbers. With the breakers, Kyle Sloter continuing to be the guy, 100% of the snaps, dropbacks, all that. But again, you got to wonder, nine points out of this offense, not exactly the sort of explosion we were hoping for. You wonder if Zach Smith and or Shea Patterson can get going. Next week is the biggest like must-win game of the season for the breakers because right now they are 5-3, and three, but the Bandits are 4-4. Four and four. They're in the same desert. They're in the same division. If they lose, all of a sudden they're going to be tied. You don't want to be worrying about tiebreakers all the way into week 10 of the season. But sticking in the moment in the running back room, Jordan Ellis, Anthony Jones continuing to split things pretty evenly. Ellis, slight 56 to 44% snap lead, 11 carries. Anthony Jones, though, 10 carries and the target and got the goal line touchdown. So a little bit similar to what we're seeing with the uh, generals in terms of Trey Williams being Sometimes the lead overall back, but then Darius Victor getting the fantasy-friendly goal line touches. I think that's how we can look at Jordan Ellis with Jones getting the goal line touches. At wide receiver, Jonathan Adams. Hand up. I still think he's a baller, but he hasn't been playing like the best wide receiver in the league over the past few weeks. Multiple big drops. He did come back and have a couple nice gains in this one, but man, you know, eight targets, 89 air yards. I would have thought he would have had a lot more production with that sort of usage. He does remain the clear-cut number one uh, receiver in terms of routes. He was at 80%. Taiwan Taylor, 71%. Dixon, 63%. Poindexter, 56%. When all these guys are healthy, Adams is the one, and then the rest kind of eat into each other 
others' targets a little bit too much. So any given week, it's still Adams and Dixon we're expecting to be the most featured. But also Sal Canella, people. I mean, this is a tight end who might as well be called a wide receiver. 95% route rate, better than anyone. Nine targets, 110 air yards. Uh, the volume was certainly there. And a reason why he was one of the recommended DFS plays going into last week. So yeah, not the most exciting game in the world, but Stallions league best defense once again. Bails them out. I mean, let's face it. We have not seen this Birmingham offense be that great of a unit. And as we discussed in our preview episode last week, not even a top four offense in terms of PFF overall grade. So, eight no Stallions. They can beat anybody. We've have clearly seen that. They have literally beaten everybody, I believe, um, in this league or pretty damn close to it at this point. But at the same time, you do wonder if, you know, they've face off against a Stars team or against a better version of the Breakers or just a team that can score 20, 30 points, do they have the offensive firepower to keep up if Jamar Smith is not going to be playing to the best of his capabilities? We'll find out. Either way, 8-0, win, 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 win is a win is a win, and, and we'll see what the Breakers can do next week against the Bandits. Philadelphia Stars took down the Michigan Panthers 46 to 24. That's right, 46 to 24. And just one small thing. I mean, for pro football talk, Mike Florio, you know, come on, man. Why do you got to be just taking unprovoked shots at USFL, talking about how the Stallions Breakers 10 9 game, like, oh, that's not the score that this league needs to be able to survive. And then just to be completely silent when the next game goes 46 to 24. So. Again, it's just one of these things where I, I, don't, I don't understand the negative vibes and like the, the NFL fandom. How come all these people on Twitter feel like they're, you know, freaking Rob Lowe wearing like just the only NFL logo hat on the sidelines? Like, if you don't care, just shut up about it. I, if you, it's one of these things where someone's like, oh, no, I really don't care. I'm, I'm not mad. Like, all right, just we believe you. Just shut up about it then. So with that off my chest, this was a very fun game that looked like it was going to get out of hand early, but credit to the Michigan Panthers pack. And Lynch for keeping it semi competitive at least in the first half. So Matt Colburn got things started. The just featured running back that had to be used more than ever this week with Darnell Holland inactive. And then we also had Paul Terry on the injury report with an issue as well. So Colburn splits out wide early on, motions out. Nobody covers him. He ends up catching a 23 yard touchdown. Again, not really anyone near him. First of uh, several on the day for Colburn. He goes ahead and scores on the next drive from just one yard out. Finally figured out who he reminds me of. Matt Colburn is the USFL's version of Austin Eckler. He's got the turf tape. He's small. He kind of runs in a similar way. And he can catch the ball. So, you know, tell all your friends that. And I'm sure you'll get a big boost in social circles. Paxton Lynch, though, did get the start in this one, as we thought he might, despite Josh Love playing pretty well last week. This was the first game Lynch has played since, I think, week three when he hurt his ankle in the first place. Didn't look terrible out there and was able to run for a one-yard touchdown to keep things a little bit close in the first half. Almost had a second one-yard touchdown run later in the game, fumbled on the goal line, though. So that's the one thing about the Stars in this game. We know the offense is good, but they were a fumble on the goal line away from giving up 30-plus to the freaking fighting Jeff Fishers. Not a great performance by the defense, but hey, you're gonna, you know, football is about uh, scoring more points than the opposition, so if you can do that, who cares how many points you give up in the first place, I guess. But the star, I don't know how I got so far in this game without saying his name already, Case freaking cook us everyone give give rf you know you guys have seen him going crazy on twitter give him you know his first team all fan award whatever the hell it is because case cook is absolutely balling had not seen a performance like this from him or really any other quarterback in the usfl but he pulled it off so kudos to case cook is i mean he forced into action of Brian Scott, unfortunately, out of the picture with that ankle injury. And for Cook is to come out and do the things he did in this one, you could just see his confidence getting even better and better as the game went on. And why the hell not? Five-yard touchdown to Jordan Sewell. Nine-yard touchdown from Devin Gray, but just efficient the whole way, man. There were drives where the ball wasn't even hitting the ground. And so he has those. All of a sudden, the Stars, you know, they got a 14-point lead. Then he throws a 51-yard bomb to tight end Pro Wells. Fantastic name, by the way. And like, my God, you think you're done with it? No way. 79-yard scramble for a touchdown. Like, holy shit, people. This was crazy. I have not seen a long monster touchdown run like this that was this slow since JT Barrett against Minnesota back in 2014. So check out the article. I linked those runs if you're just trying to see some slow monster runs. But, hey, he was fast enough. He said uh, afterwards with some of the mics that it was the most athletic thing he'd ever done in his life. So, truly, to see Case Cook is 
just go like back to back 51 yard touchdown to a 79 yard scramble. Uh, just a fantastic game. So other touchdowns uh, in the game, Michigan Panthers, Paxton Lynch, 33 yards to tight end LaMichael Petway, who had a great game. Also hooked up with Cam Scarlett from 11 yards out later. Unfortunately, we had Reggie Corbin get hurt in this one. Naturally had all sorts of exposure to him on DraftKings over the weekend, but that's the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. But yeah, Corbin apparently suffered, I believe they said elbow and thumb injuries early on. Only had three carries in this one before he was forced to depart. So for my money's worth, Corbin has been the best running back in the USFL with the ball in his hands. But Matt Colburn starting to make a case as well. Leads us to our offensive players of the game. Got to be Stars quarterback Case Kukas, Stars running back Matt Colburn, as well as Panthers tight end LaMichael Petway. So Kukas, again, 9.5 yards per attempt. Four tutties, 118 yards on the ground. Easily PFS highest graded quarterback of the week. Emma Colburn, 48 yards and a touchdown rushing, 49 yards and a touchdown receiving. Three down workhorse here. It looks pretty good doing it. Also, LaMichael Petway, good job by him, really, in seven of his eight targets for 97 yards in that aforementioned touchdown. Defensive players of the game, Panthers defensive tackle Ethan Westbrooks, highest single defensive grade of the week at 91.8. Great job by Westbrooks. Also stars safety Ladarius Wiley ranked third with a 91.5 grade on the week. Some quick workload stuff. Case Kukas took all the meaningful snaps. We did see KJ Costello in just briefly there at the end. But yes, as long as Brian Scott is sidelined, it is the Case Kukas show. Matt Colburn, 85% snaps, 77% routes, 15 carries, three targets. I think it was more so because of these injuries, though. Again, Darnell Holland side was completely out of the picture with a leg injury. Even Paul Terry was listening on the injury report with an ankle issue. So we did see Chris uh, Rowland, their usual slot receiver, actually get four carries in this one. Seemed to be a situation where they were just had to get Colburn a break somehow, and they weren't um, they weren't confident enough in Terry to really use him despite him being active. So we've seen Colburn balling out recently, and I mean, if Holland's now banged up again, which has kind of led to Colburn like Holland and Terry getting hurt in the first place, helped Colburn get this sort of role. So the fact they're banged up certainly isn't going to let them get more snaps anytime soon. I would just say you know, 85 percent and like literally 100 percent of the backfield's carries and targets. Maybe a little bit too wishful moving forward, but either way, man, Colburn's going to need to be in, you know, cemented as a top three, if not number one freaking fantasy back here moving forward thanks to this workload in an offense that's balling. Jordan Sewell, Devin Gray, Maurice Alexander, and Bug Howard, to a slightly lesser extent, continuing to work as the big four receivers in this offense. Kukas was just fine spreading it around. I mean, it's wild to see him throw four touchdowns and not have a single receiver other than Colburn, who's a running back, listed in the players of the game. But yeah, nobody had even more than five targets. Nobody had even 50 uh, air yards. And that's the thing with Kukas. I think he only registered one big-time throw in this one. Obviously, it was a beauty to Pro Wells, but it's, you know... Maybe should have given him a little more credit in the past weeks for just making the offense work instead of having, you know, the sexy throws that look great off script but maybe aren't keeping you quite in the game the same way. So smart thing uh, my coworker Kevin Cole said a while ago is that he considers big-time throws more so of a, an indicator of a quarterback style than necessarily something that we need to really hang our hat on. So something to keep in mind as we, you know, maybe get into, you could argue, slightly more important football analysis once the fall comes around. With the Panthers side of things, again, Paxton Lynch, 100% of the snaps, well ahead of Josh Love, with them now eliminated from the playoffs, so I wouldn't be surprised if they do split things up a little bit more moving forward. And in the absence of, Reg absence of Reggie Corbin, who played just 9% of the snaps, Stevie Scott, 49%, 11 carries, 2 targets, Cam Scarlett, 43% snaps, 5 carries, 4 targets. So Scarlett, main receiving back, Scott, main rushing back, if Corbin's going to miss extended time. And at wide receiver, Lance Lenore, 98% routes, Joe Walker, 7 79%. Lenore, Lenore continues to lead the way with 12 targets and a team high 80 air yards. But we did see Ishmael Hyman have seven targets and even LaMichael Petway at eight. Kind of fluky though. I mean, they're just, look, we're using four wide receivers in this offense. Hyman was fourth in snap rate and LaMichael Petway was one of just three tight ends. Actually got a boost because Marcus Ball was out of the picture. So great game by Petway. Have a hard time believing that's going to happen again. So yeah, stars. They can put up points in a hurry. They're in the playoffs. 
Let's see what happens, guys. I mean, we, all of a sudden, you know, maybe I gave the Stars, uh, maybe I wrote them off a little too quick as a potential big three team. With the way they're playing lately, putting up these points, um, I'm going to take back my uh, assertion that there was a big three and then the little one with the Stars in this league. I, they, their defense still needs to be better, but you know what? It's 2022. If you got an offense that's capable of scoring pretty much more points than anyone in the league, as we saw last week, against a good Michigan Panthers defense, too. That's the thing. This wasn't a performance against the Maulers or anything like that. You know, weren't going out there facing Kirby Wilson. All do, you know, I get it. Jeff Fisher hasn't been the greatest ever, but too many people, I think, I saw several times on Twitter, like, oh, I tuned in the game. I saw Jeff Fisher is one and six. Now he's one and seven. We talked about it, though. It was so crazy to see that the Panthers were one and six with a minus 13 point differential. Uh, you know, in my opinion, the Maulers are what their record says they are. Still, though, Panthers and the Houston Gamblers are about to get to. Not quite as bad as your usual one win team, but hey. As Bill Parcell said, back in the day, you are what your record says you are. Final game, another short one. Tampa Bay Bandits 13, Houston Gamblers 3. One touchdown, 60 minutes of action. Not great. Was a 7-yard strike from Jordan Tiamo to Derek Dillon. Good job by Dillon breaking a tackle, muscling his way into the end zone. And yeah, that was it. Bandits 13, Gamblers 3. Offensive players of the game. Got to go at Gamblers guard to Rome Prescott and Gamblers tight end Cheyenne O'Grady. Why? Those are the only players in this game to post a PFF grade over even 70. Like, my God. You don't even have... You guys have not just seen how hard it is to name a player of the game until you've gone through a game where neither offense passed 250 total yards. Just a rough one, particularly from Tiamu. Someone that looked like he was starting to pick it up at the midway point just hasn't exactly gone the way we were hoping for on the season. But on defense, we did have some good performances. Gamblers edge, Chris Odom. Three sacks and a weak high seven pressures. Also, Generals defensive tackle Toby Johnson uh, had four pressures and a sack in his own right. So, Quickly with some fantasy notes with the Bandits, Jordan Tiamo continuing to take every snap. I mentioned before, but they season is on the line next week against the Breakers. I will continue to expect Tiamo to take each and every snap. In the backfield, though, we did see B.J. Emmons get back to taking the lead over Jawan Washington. Hasn't been the case for the past few weeks since Emmons came back from injury, but Emmons had 50% snaps, 62% routes. Washington was at 44% and 19% respectively. With that said, Washington 19 carries and a target. Emmons 13 carries and two targets. USFL, I love you guys, clearly. Why else would I be talking about this league as much as I do? You're not doing yourself any favors when you're putting Jawan Washington in the freaking player of the week graphic. They put him in there with like 19 or 20 carries for 60 yards and no touchdowns next to freaking Case Kukas and Matt Colburn who were going completely bonkers. So you don't need to pick a player from every game. Don't. You see what I did here? Like I made it pretty clear that I wasn't comparing these offensive players of the game to the rest of the league. Can't do that. Just, just can't do that, guys. At wide receiver, though, Derek Dillon, 77% routes. They used seven wide receivers this week, guys. I've been tired of this all year with the Bandits. Usually it was six wide receivers. Now we got seven. We got to get D. Anderson a target and 8% of the routes when you have a chance to, I guess. But, yeah, Dillon and our guy, John Franklin, continuing to lead the way. Franklin almost had a touchdown here. They gave him a carry as well, and he's returning kicks. Like, that's why he's the always the suggested stacking partner with Tiamu. Like, we're just trying to open ourselves up to the most possibilities with the football in his hands unfortunately the potential 20 yard touchdown looked like his back foot just wasn't quite in bounds so we'll continue to ride with john franklin but Derek dillon carving out his uh path as well but yeah another offense where not even one player had more than five targets the good news though we actually had, um, what's his name, Daquan Hampton, their usual second tight end. He was inactive, so this is actually important. Next week, if we can again confirm that Daquan Hampton is inactive, tight end Shiano Grady, who was out there, 85% of the routes, four targets, a whopping 14 air yards. If we can just confirm Hampton's out, though, O'Grady is going to be the recommended stacking partner. We saw him go off in week one with Tiamu. It's just been a problem getting him on the field. Why has it been a problem? I don't know, but... We have hopefully solved that if, uh, again, we're going to see Hampton out of the picture starting next week. With the Gamblers, Kenji Baher, recommended start because I thought he'd play every snap, and he did. He had 41 dropbacks and eight carries, just couldn't even find the end zone once. So 
oh well, Clayton Thorson with that elbow on the inactive list. Looks like Kenji will continue to be that guy. But yeah, certainly didn't seem to get the best effort from all the gamblers with them already eliminated from playoff contention. Also were without some of their best talents. Mark Thompson, unfortunately, had to miss this game due to an illness. Devwall Whaley ended up getting the start. 69% of the snaps, 62% of the routes, 11 carries and 4 targets. Dalen Dawkins was used as the clear number 2 with 31% snaps, just 5 carries and 3 targets. So if Thompson's good to go next week, expect him to come back in and dominate the usage, as he usually does, but when they are going to keep all 3 guys involved, that's when it's again more, like we were talking about with Scarborough Thompson, a safe bet for 15 combined carries and targets, sure be a lot cooler if it was 20 to 25. At wide receiver, naturally my preferred stacking partner, Rick Kenji, ended up being a late scratch with an illness. They list him as a full go, but they put him on the inactive list anyway. I don't know. Tyler Simmons, Anthony Ratliff-Williams, Tyler Polka, and Tio Redding ended up working as the big four pass game options. So JoJo Ward was also plenty involved. I mean, I do love what the gamblers are doing. They just said F to tight end position at some point. So Tyler Simmons, Ratliff-Williams, Polka, Redding, and JoJo Ward, all of them were over a 50% route rate. Redding had eight targets. Ratliff-Williams had seven targets. Unfortunately, you know, just with the three points being scored thing, uh, weren't able to to get much fantasy points out of those so yeah guys bandits haven't really played their best ball like in the same game on defense and offense i think once all year but they're four and four they're still alive in the playoffs and we got some interesting football still to be played so you know obviously the stars the freaking stallions and the generals have already clinched their playoff burst we'll find out if this could be the bandits or the breakers I'm excited. So we got two more weeks, week nine and week 10 of the regular season. Then these four teams are going to Canton. I will be doing everything in my power to get there for that championship weekend. Maybe even twist some arms, try to get a sideline pass. Hashtag send Harditz to Canton. Why the hell not, everyone? So appreciate you guys tuning in as always. It's been a fun year. Block out what the haters say. I probably need to do a better job of that myself. And we'll continue to enjoy some live football. So thanks again for tuning in. I'm Ian Harditz. Until next time, take care, everybody.